this morning, I figured since we are in the holiday weekend, really, let's talk about Thanksgiving and exactly what Thanksgiving is and having that proper attitude that we have. And of course, we start out with the fact of the meaning of Thanksgiving. Because oftentimes, you know, we're always focused on Thanksgiving, but what does it actually mean to be thankful? Um, especially when you're looking at it from a scriptural perspective. The word thankful in scripture actually has its root in the word grace, which is kind of interesting because it is, you remember, grace is an expression of or an attitude in which a benefit is given without consideration of merit. And thankfulness actually comes from that. So when it comes to grace, we actually do have two sides of it. You know, we have those who receive grace and those who are the ones who are actually showing grace. So both sides in that aspect. The one showing grace can give a benefit without consideration of merit, or they can actually show favor to another person. So you have both aspects of it. Now, th there is a distinction here, by the way, in the way that grace is expressed between the New Testament and the Old Testament. We do need to kind of understand that. Because Old Testament, what we would typically refer to as grace, is a little bit different than what we get in the New Testament. It would be better actually expressed in the Old Testament as favor. John chapter 1 and verse 17 gives us an understanding that there is a division between how really God is expressing favor compared to grace. And here in John chapter 1 and verse 17, it says the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And that came is actually a word that means came to be, which is indicating that it wasn't actually expressed in the same way prior to Christ, prior to Christ actually coming. Favor was given prior to the incarnation of Christ, as we see a couple of examples of this. Noah is a really good example of this. Now, most of our translations, by the way, will say that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But that actually, the, the Hebrew word behind that isn't really equivalent to the Greek word, which means, you know, or a better way of saying that is the type of attitude that God had towards Noah is not the same type of attitude that he has towards us in Christ. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, which would imply that there was some element that Noah was seeking God. Or Noah, and actually it does talk about the fact that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and he found favor. In it. Now, going back and studying that uh, passage out, we also find out that in that particular period of time, Noah was 100% human. And what does that mean? These, the fallen spirit beings were attempting to corrupt the seed of man. That remind you of something that's going on today. But they're not fallen spirit beings that are trying to do that. They're trying to change things. Well, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, um, not the same aspect of grace. And we see actually it expressed as favor also with Gideon when he says, then he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight. Now, he's not saying grace. He's saying favor because he's not sure if I go up to, to battle against these people, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to win if I don't have favor in your eyes. So, and our translations typically express it as favor. It's the same word, by the way. So, it would be better in the Old Testament to express it as uh, really as favor, not as grace. The one receiving grace expresses appreciation for what is received, which is actually expressed by good grace towards another person. Yes. Oh, what is the Hebrew word for favor? Uh, off the top of my head, I do not recall it. Um, I know it starts with a <laughs> but, but unfortunately, uh, and I think it has a resh in it. Chesed. Chesed. There it is. Chesed. Yep. Yep. So, and that is typically, that would be much better expressed in our language as favor, not as grace. Because the way we use grace today, we're actually expressing the grace that's shown to us in Christ by God in relation to salvation. So when it comes to actually the concept of grace, we have 
one who gives a benefit without consideration of merit. Now, remember that that's an important definition to have or to understand, because a lot of times when you hear the concept of grace, they'll say unmerited favor. But that's really leaving part of grace out because grace doesn't care whether you could actually earn it or not. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you are good enough. It's about choosing the person choosing to give a person, another person a benefit. Simple as that. You know, now in this case, of course, it's God giving us a benefit, but he's not considering whether we could or could not deserve it. That's not what grace actually, uh, that's not how grace works. So you're receiving the benefit. On the other side, we're expressing appreciation for it. And like I said, that is actually, it's literally the word grace with a, uh, um, the word good added onto the top, the front of it, or a, 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 an addition, that's what I'm trying to say, prefix uh, that uh, implies good. So it's a very interesting word, actually, because we do not express good grace to God. We're not going to show God grace. But we do actually expect, express appreciation for what we actually received. So it's not giving of a benefit. So it's not in that sense. It actually does have the meaning of uh, we are a, a being appreciative for receiving a benefit. And we're having that proper attitude towards that benefit that we're actually receiving. So thankfulness is an attitude by which we express appreciation for what we receive from others. And so we're expressing this appreciation. And in expressing that appreciation, being thankful actually comes from an attitude of gratitude for, of course, the benefit received. And in order to actually have this type of attitude, we need to actually understand the value of the thing that was actually provided. Or, or another way of saying this is we need to actually, or it's Thanksgiving comes through understanding. Having a proper understanding of things really helps in relation to how we express our appreciation for something. Really, if you think about it, how can you be thankful for something you really don't understand the benefit of it at all? It's kind of difficult to be thankful. And we see this in, in scripture, and there's a lot of uh, good examples of this. Within the church, it is important to do things in an orderly manner. It's very important to do things in an orderly manner in the church. If we do not understand, how can we be thankful? Now, Paul is dealing with the church in Corinth. We're over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 16. And these are really where, you know, your, your Pentecostal charismatics are, are rooted in because they don't like to read the rest of the passage, but, you know, they want to come in and they want to talk in, they want to speak in tongues and they want to prophesy and they want to give a word of wisdom and all of this other stuff, but they're doing it out of order and it doesn't make any sense. And Paul is calling them out for that. He says, otherwise, if you bless, that is, you speak well of something with the spirit, how will he who occupies the space of the uninformed say, amen, if you're giving of thanks or at your giving of thanks, since he doesn't understand what you're saying? So what value is speaking in a, in a language within the church that the people who are there cannot, cannot understand what you're saying? How are they supposed to express a man, which would be it is true, there's an agreement there, if they can't understand you're actually expressing thankfulness. You know, that's not, uh, that doesn't work well. And of course, they were um, trying to say that you could do this in the spirit. All things should be done for the edification of the saints. That's really important within the church is it's about building each other up and growing and maturing. It's not about somebody who has a special gift and then therefore we should be focusing on that person or giving that person a more benefits than others well another way of saying that is they're more equal than others because remember we're all equal in christ you know but yet sometimes people want to imply that they have a relationship to god that's closer than anybody else because of what they do or they can be 1 Corinthians 14, 17 says, 
for you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edifying. So he's saying, yeah, you may be actually expressing appreciation, but it's not edifying to those in the church. There's no edification there. And things that are done within the church should be for the edification of the saints. That's really actually important. It is important that the message is clear and accurate so people can understand and, of course, be thankful. That's, that's really important. You know, and this, uh, this, of course, comes where the concept of speaking in tongues is something that should not be done within the assemblies because it is something that will cause confusion. It is not something that uh, is going to be clear. Now, of course, you know, if you've heard me uh, teach for very long, you'll know very quickly um, the reality is speaking in tongues is not something that's active today. So if somebody is speaking in tongues, there's a problem there. But it was active in the, um, in the beginning of the church. It was active. And it is something we can learn from because what value is it in the assembly if we are doing things that people don't actually understand? You're not explaining things to them. You know, they can't be thankful. So speaking in tongues is one example of this. Now, speaking in tongues was used as a sign to the Jews. Now, there's plenty of proof to this, by the way. I'm only running through a couple of these, but there's more than enough proof to show that it was a sign to the Jews. It wasn't to the Gentiles. You know, Acts chapter 2, right from the very beginning, Acts chapter 2 and verse 7 says, And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, not Jews and Gentiles, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Now, this is the beginning of the church. This is when Peter stands up and he explains what is going on because these people come together, they hear this loud rushing of wind, but of course, there's no buildings falling over. It's a sound that they're hearing. There's no wind that they're feeling, so it draws all these people together to figure out what, what is this? I mean, it would be the same thing, you know, today, if you heard this really loud sound, but yet what you would expect, nothing's there. So go investigate, what in the world is going on? It drew them and it drew the Jews over there. And that's important to pay attention to because this is when they start to speak in another tongue. Um, and of course here, and their confusion because everyone heard them speaking in their own language in verse seven, then they were all amazed and marveled saying to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans. Now, this is an interesting passage because if you're not really understanding what's going here, you're not quite picking up their shock. Okay. Because if you are native to an area, how are you going to tend to speak the language? If you learn the language of another, another language, how are you going to tend to speak the language? Now, what am I saying there? Isn't there quite a, a difference between somebody who natively speaks the language and somebody who learned it? Typically, it's in your accent. Sometimes it's in the way you use words because you don't quite use them the same way. There's a distinction, and that's what they're seeing. They're hearing these people speak in their dialect, but they can tell by the, their appearance, these are not people from my area. You know, how in the world can they speak so well. Um, actually, I remember, I guess it's a kind of a good example, because I remember being in Russia, and we were with a group of Americans, and I was talking, and this lady looks at me, she says, you speak English so well. You know, and I'm like, it's because I'm an American. <laughs> you know? uh, but it, it was just out of place to her. It's like, you're speaking it in a way that isn't normal for what I'm hearing all around. You know, it, it, everybody speaks it with a bit of an accent. You're, you're not speaking with an accent. That's what they were actually doing here. That's the thing that, sh that really shocked them. And of course, with the Jews, what are they saying? This is being spoken in a Gentile tongue. God is doing something. We better pay attention to what God is doing because God told Israel, I will speak to you in other tongues. So they're paying attention. And how is it that we hear each one in our own language? In our own language here, by the way, it's dialect. Um, it's not your normal language. The one that they were born. 
Cretans and Arabs, we hear these um, speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. And actually, by the way, it specifically tells you what tongues, what, what was being expressed, the works of God. What works is he, is he referring to? The works that God did to Israel, expressing those works so that Israel would actually understand this is for Israel. Misuse in the Corinthian assembly with the speaking in tongues, because it was active at that time, because we do have it being a, a, the gospel is being ministered primarily to the Israel, and it's beginning to go out to the Gentiles, but it started with Israel. And the, the church in Corinth is misusing it, and they're, they're causing a lot of confusion, and Paul is expressing this. It's, they're not speaking to, to men. Now, don't misinterpret this, because some people want to misinterpret this and say, oh, well, we're speaking to God. Okay, read the whole entire passage, you know, because it's really, under, it's really important. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Of course, because men aren't understanding what he's saying, but God understands. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. He's speaking something by the spirit that others don't understand. It's not revealed to them. Now he's going to need somebody to, or somebody who actually understands that language to reveal it to him. You know, and by the way, this isn't gibberish. This is actually a legitimate language that a person is speaking, which does mean today, as, as ironic as this is, if somebody claims to be speaking in tongues, pull up your Google translator. And if your Google translator can't understand them, they're not speaking in tongues. That's what this passage actually says in scripture, Acts. That's what it's referring to. Okay. So really a person speaking in tongues is just doing nothing but edifying themselves. And we see this in 4, uh, first, first Corinthians 14, 4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Now there was prophecy active at this time because the church didn't have the full revelation. But prophecy is for the edification of all. It's not for the edification of the individual. Or speaking in tongues is for the edification of the individual. So the person speaking in tongues couldn't understand that language they were speaking? Correct. Actually, it does talk about the fact in Scripture it says that with their mind they don't understand. So how is he edifying himself? Because he's drawing attention to himself. There is no, especially if you don't have somebody to translate it, what are you basically saying to everybody? Well, I'm special because I can speak in this language and you can't. We get that today where people want to say that you're not a Christian unless you speak in tongues. Mm -hmm. or And then they want to go to a second baptism, a baptism by fire. I really wish people would actually understand what that term baptism by fire means. And what do I mean by that? Go look at the rest of the passages in scripture where it talks about fire. It's not a good thing. It's judgment. And we are not baptized by fire. Uh, when fire, when likened to fire came upon the disciples, it doesn't say fire, it says likened to. It was a representation, a visual sign for the Jews that God was doing something. We don't have that happen today. You know, otherwise, you'd literally see something that was likened to fire come upon you. But there's no need for that. So I was thinking that they translate edifies but actually it's more uh, builds up themselves like with the domain yes um it, it the word there edify can mean it literally comes from building of a house yeah. it's that idea so this person is actually really building themselves up and giving themselves value where the rest of the people they can't understand what they're saying you know there's no no value to that at all should only be done when there is an interpreter present. You know, so again, when it comes to things in the church, we want to be cautious and pay attention to people that are around us. It's not just about speaking in tongues. It's about anything and everything that we do. We don't have special um, mysteries that only we as an assembly can know. And yeah, I know of some assemblies who want to claim that they're the only ones that have, that have this mystery, this, this truth, but they don't want to share it with anybody. That's not scriptural. So 1 Corinthians 14.5 talks about this. 
I wish you all speak with tongues, but even more that you prophesy, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So he's saying just coming and, and blurting out a, a, a sentence in another language is no value. But if somebody interprets it, there would be value to the church. And the other one who speaks in tongues cannot interpret that. It has no profit to the listener if the listener doesn't understand it. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophecy or by teaching? And speaking in tongues isn't going to have any value to you. There's no profit to it at all. It is not active today, Acts chapter 13 and verse 8. Love never fails. Whether there are prophecies, it actually doesn't say they will fail. That's not a very good translation at all. It literally uses the word for working and causing something to no longer work in the way that it was intended. Now, of course, how would prophecy cease to be effective in working? We have the full revelation, so we don't need prophecy anymore. And we, if we have the full revelation, we're not going to get more revelation. Uh, whether they are tongues, um, the, the term here, they will cease, actually literally says they will cause themselves to cease. And why will the speaking in tongues cause itself to cease? Because it's assigned to Israel, it's not assigned to the church. There's no edification for the church in speaking in tongues. So what value does it have to the church? It causes itself to cease when, this, when the sign is no longer effective. Uh, whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And of course, that, that word vanish away does not mean to, the way they make that sound, it's like no knowledge is going to, we're all not going to have any knowledge. It's just going to vanish. That's not what it's saying. It's saying we'll be rendered ineffective because the gift of one who has knowledge will no longer have the importance to the church when the church has all the knowledge. Where Where is that gift going to be effective anymore i can open the book and i can get the exact same information from the book and by the way if you truly had the gift of knowledge that's exactly what you would be giving is the exact same information that's in the book so it renders it ineffective so speaking in tongues is not something that should be used now because when we do things where it's it, there's not an understanding we're not going to be thankful for them Using other spiritual gifts for um, evidence are also ones who are not, uh, and, and they cause confusion. This 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8 through 10, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm picking on speaking in tongues a little bit because you see that more predominantly. But there are people who want to come and say that they prophesy. There's one who want to come and say that they, they speak uh, or uh, healing um, gifts of healing, uh, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, and all of this stuff, which the Old Testament, or excuse me, the, the early church did actually need this information because they didn't have the full revelation. And uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10 talks about these. For to one it is given the word of wisdom from the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge from the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit. So the ones who have actually... Um, are no longer edifying, these aren't in effect anymore because we have the full revelation. To another, the working of miracles. We don't have miracles today. Why don't we have miracles today? Predominantly, the church is Gentile. What do we as Gentiles seek? Knowledge. We don't seek a sign. So what value does a miracle have to us? It actually doesn't. And I, and I have seen many people and talked to people who claim they've seen miracles, but I don't see an impact in their life. And what do I mean by that? It didn't change the way they lived their life. Well, what good is a miracle if it's not going to change the way you live your life? What's the point of a miracle? Prophecy, discerning of spirits, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues. These are all gifts, of course, that were given for a reason. They had their benefits. Healing, God was showing that he was the one who actually is sending this person. 
by healing them. By the way, healing was not something that was normal. How many people were healed before Christ actually came and walked the earth? Nobody went around healing anybody. I know of a couple of resuscitations where the prophets were allowed to bring somebody back to life. They didn't resurrect them. They just resuscitated them. Okay. But no healings. Why was Jesus healing people? So that he could prove he was God? He fulfilled the scripture and what he was doing and what God said, because every time he healed somebody, what did he tell them to do? Go to the priest. Why did he go to the priest? Verification that that person was actually healed. Yeah. And like with leprosy, what were they required to do? Go to the priest and go through the process that was required by law for them to verify that they actually are healed are completely there's no leprosy at all anymore. you know there was verification a discerning of spirits we want to be careful with that today oh absolutely it was a testimony to the priest when they would go because this is something that's unprecedented i mean could you imagine uh, ministering to a person for years who have who has we'll use leprosy as an example because it's a very it's very visible and at that time completely uncurable granted there are some leprosies today that are still uncurable and you know that this person they this is their life you you've dealt with this and then all of a sudden they walk in and they're like it's all gone they're like how well i met this guy <laughs> And he started describing him, you know, and the fact that they, they understood that this was the Messiah. So it was to them. Uh, they said discerning of spirits is something we want to be cautious about because we don't have that today. And really, somebody who implies that they can discern spirits and they can understand spiritual things, are they, is there any understanding involved in that to other people? There isn't. So really, that person could be saying anything they want to say. And there's no way to verify. There's no way for me to be thankful if I'm not understanding what I'm doing. It's the same thing with wisdom. You can't give me more wisdom than I already have. And as a matter of fact, if I need wisdom, what am I supposed to do, according to scripture? Ask God for it. I don't go ask another person in the church. I go ask God for it. Uh, the knowledge, of course, I can't have wisdom without knowledge. But I have the full revelation. So what value would it be to have the gift of knowledge now if it's literally repeating exactly what's written down? Where before they did not have that. We also have the proper use of laying on of hands and properly understanding how these things are actually used in scripture. The, the laying on of hands, by the way, is actually um, a thing that the Jews did, which means to accept someone. That's really what its purpose was. Acts chapter 8 and verse 17, and they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, in the context here, we are dealing with people who are in Samaria. The gospel was sent to them, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. When did they receive the Holy Spirit? When the apostles came down and laid hands on them. What is the significance of a Jew laying their hands upon a Samaritan? Remember the Samaritan woman at the, the well when she was talking to Jesus? And well, Jesus said something to her, and she and her response was, "You're a Jew. Why in the world are you speaking to me?" Yeah, they didn't know. Absolutely not. So by laying their hands on them, they were accepting them. They were actually accepting them. And there's a huge significance. What is God doing here? He's showing the Jews that the Gentiles are now being accepted. They actually have that. He also showed this with Peter. And then Peter went into the house of a Gentile, and he got, almost got crucified for it by the Jews. Well, okay, I shouldn't say crucified because that's, you know, sensitive. But he, he was very much, I mean, they were ready to basically kick him out. And he's like, hey, God told me to do it. Who am I to actually go against this? And you can, you know, the people that were with me, they're witnesses to what God did. You know, it was for the Jews. 
Improperly thinking the laying on of hands causes one to receive the Holy Spirit. I wish people would actually read the rest of this because they're like, oh, the laying on of hands. And then, you know, we get people who want to come and say that there's value to laying on the, the laying on of hands. Well, we actually write in the same context. We have the uh, sorcerer who was saying, give me this power also that anyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. And he was rebuked for it because he's saying, <laughs> you missed the point, is what he was really saying in the context. You completely missed the point. We also have an example of laying on of hands with the sending out of specific missions. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. And of course, again, it's, it's an association, it's an acceptance of what they're doing and being part of that uh, ministry that they're involved in. Uh, we have over in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 22, another example of this, the importance of laying on of hands. This is actually really important. Here he says, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. Now, oftentimes today, I hear this as though you're grabbing a hold of somebody to accuse them, but in the context, that's not what he's talking about. In the context, he's talking about, don't be in agreement with somebody quickly. And how do I know that? Because it says, nor share in another person's sin. Keep yourself pure. Be careful who you associate with, who you are seen as being in agreement with. You know, take some time to understand the person. You know, that's really important. And by the way, that's important for inside the church and outside the church. Even in business, that's really important to get to know the person. Are they a person of their word? Are they going to do what they say? You know, other stuff like that. God qualifies us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who qualifies us? God qualifies us. We don't qualify ourselves. God is the one who qualified us. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers. That is, we actually have a part in the inheritance of the saints in light. It's really important to actually understand that so that we can be thankful for what God has actually given us. He's the one. And, you know, to be honest with you, I am very, very thankful, I guess, for lack of a, you know, because it's hard to explain, to understand, because if he left it up to me, what would I do? I, I well, I, I'd mess it up. I would. But he's the one who qualified. Me. And how do I know that? I got plenty of history of mankind messing it up every single time. Every single time. Understanding what is involved in salvation is also something that's really important. Really important. You know, the fact that we're taken out of Adam and we're placed into Christ. This is something that, you know, is, it should be predominant in the teaching of all churches, is understanding the fact that the way God interacts with us now is different. Because he literally has placed us into a new creation where we're no longer condemned. In Adam, we were actually condemned. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 talks about this. It says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of one body being many are one body, so also is, and it actually has an article there, so also is the Christ. Now, is it saying that Christ as a person is a body? That doesn't make any sense. It's the new creation in which we have been placed. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21 goes through this in detail. I would really encourage you to get a good translation of this particular passage because many of our translations, what they do is they, they change the words out. And they know the meaning of them, but between sin, trespass, and transgression, they interchange them and it causes a lot of confusion in this particular passage. And they're completely different words, by the way. Sin is an action. Trespass happens within the mind. A transgression requires a law. And we as Christians transgress? 
we're not under law, so we can't transgress the law. Could Eve transgress? She did because she broke the law. She was under a law. God said, don't eat of this tree. And she did that. So I understand the difference between those because uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail because uh, I would love to, but I just don't have enough time because <laughs> this is a very good passage to understand. You know, we have been taken out of Adam. We've been placed into Christ. And that, that relates to our position before God. We're no longer ones who are condemned. If we're not condemned, really think about that. You're not condemned. You're not bound to live by the sin nature anymore. We're made alive in our spirit. Our rational part. Not in our emotions. Our emotions still are not saved. Our emotions still a part of us that actually doesn't have that benefit of being connected to God. But our spirit does. Our rationale does. Uh, well, in this case, yes, and I realized because it's a header, it capped it, but yeah, technically, we're talking about our spirit, yes. Uh, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, it says, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him, is one spirit. That's what being alive in the spirit means. We are now connected to God. If we are connected to God in our spirit, our rational part, that means we can actually understand spiritual things. Where prior to this, humans couldn't understand spiritual things. And I'm, I'm talking about the things that relate to our salvation, to our Christian life, those kinds of things we couldn't understand. What would we as, as humans continually do when God presents us with spiritual things? We can, we can actually use Israel as an example, can't we? God miraculously brought them out of Egypt. Now remember, God didn't just bring them out. He smashed Egypt. He crushed them. Okay. Brought them out. Brought them to the mountain. Okay. Said, you, you guard my covenant. That's all I want you to do. Now what was the covenant? It was a covenant of promise, the promised land. That's the only covenant that was active at that time. What was Israel's response? Oh, you keep on telling us what to do and we'll do it. And then they got the law. <laughs> God didn't tell them, try to do it yourself and be good. God never instructed them to do that. They're the ones who actually said that. We do the same thing. When we don't understand spiritual things, we try to use our own works to show that we're worthy but we're not. But now that we're out of Adam and we're placed into Christ, we can produce works that are good, but they're not works that come from our own self-effort. They're works that are using what God is actually giving us. Knowing our position before God is something that's really important. We really can't understand our, and be thankful for our, our salvation if we're not understanding our position before God. God's not angry with us. He's not standing, uh, you know, he's not sitting on his throne with a big, big frowny face just waiting for you to mess up so he can whip you. He does, you know, a lot of times people have that attitude towards God, that it's about discipline. But really, truly, what is the purpose of discipline? If we're truly going to discipline somebody, and I'm talking about proper discipline, what is the intent of all discipline? Correction. Correction for what? For the benefit of the one who's being disciplined. So when we're disciplined by God, it's not because he's angry at us, it's because he doesn't want us to go that direction because it's not good for us. That's what he's actually doing. We are placed as sons. You know the significance of that? You know, a lot of times like, eh, okay, well, I'm a son. No, I actually understand what you mean to be a son. And by the way, being a son has nothing to do with the sex of a person, which means both male and female are in this position. 
Ephesians chapter 1 and, four, and verse 5, having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasures of his desire as well. Absolutely terrible translation. And why do I say that? Well, for one, it uses the word predestined. And predestined implies that my destiny has already been predetermined. The problem with that is the word behind this doesn't mean predestined. It actually means horizon. It's a bit different. Um, it would better come across as having marked off our bounds. Well, that's kind of important. And what does that mean? That means the boundaries that we in the church have is we will always be in a position of sons. Of course, we've got to understand the significance of that. Um, this, this is, I do believe this was the NAS that I pulled up here. Uh, it says adoptions of sons, which is almost kind of funny because um, there is no actual separate word for son. It's actually within the same word, and it literally means the placement of a son. Uh, we've talked about this passage before and this particular word. Um, and I'll get a little Greekish on you just so you kind of, you know, understand this. There are actually two specific Greek words that would come across as adoption in what we understand adoption today. This word isn't one of them. This is a completely different word, has nothing to do with what we would understand as adoption. We are not adopted into God's family. You are not the stepchild. You're not the adopted child you are actually a legitimate child of God. Okay, we can't be legitimate children and be adopted children. Doesn't work that way. First John very clearly states, we are children of God. We are legitimate children. He's talking about our position. What's the significance of that? A son is an under law. We're not under law. And why? Because as sons, we actually have everything we need to be ones who are mature and can act mature. Does, does a son, well, let's put it this way. When you're going through school and you have your schoolmaster, if you have a good school, they're going to hold you to the, to the fire to get your work done. Why? So that you are actually able to do the things when you're, when you graduated, do, do you go back and you, and you're under your schoolmaster again? You're not. You know, I don't go to my college professor and he governs my life or tells me what kind of work I'm going to do. That would be really silly. I've already done that. It's the same thing with being ones who are Christians. We don't go back to being under the law, which was a tutor and a guardian until the faith of Christ comes in. When we don't, law just govern, well, literally the term is garrisoned around. Law told you where to go and when to, to do it. And if you didn't want to, it just took your life. Nine out of 10 of the, of the 10 commandments, death was actually a potential penalty of those. Galatians chapter four, verses one through two talks about this. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, and by the way, this word child here is a word that is napios. And it actually is being used as one who is an inarticulate babbler. I do like that word because it's kind of hilarious. But it so describes so many people today who claim to be Christians, and they can't even articulate what they actually believe. I mean, the stuff coming out of their mouth, it, it contradicts. It's, it, it just doesn't make any sense because they're, they're not growing. They're not maturing. So as long as the child, uh, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from the slave, Though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Now, of course, when he's appointed by the father that time, what does that mean? He's mature. He should be mature. He should be able to actually do things. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14 talk about this. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. The very basics of the Christian life again. But you should be teachers by this time, is what he's saying to these saints. You have been saints long enough to where you should be able to teach the basics to anybody. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He is a babe. He's an inarticulate babbler. Same term. 
but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. Well, the full age literally means those who are mature. Those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And your word good and evil here, uh, let me grab it just to make sure I'm on the right ones. It, good means that which is proper and evil means that which lacks in character. Remember, there's a couple of different kinds of ways to express evil and good. You can have proper for good and beneficial. There are two different ways of expressing that. This is doing what is proper. And then on the evil side, you have a malignant spreading evil. And then you have someone who's just doing something lacking in character. Okay. This is the lacking in character. We actually should be able to discern what? The difference between good and evil. But it takes, we have that ability because of who we are in Christ. Comprehending our position in Christ, no condemnation. Oh, that's so important. Hebrews, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Now, I did pull up this whole, I said, I think I said that wrong. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Um, I did pull up this whole verse because I want to, to be reminded of the fact that the, the last half of this verse in the King James, New King James, and a few others, they add in something that puts a condition on it that isn't in the original. It actually comes from the Latin. So I'll read what's in the original first. It says, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what it actually says. There is no condemnation. You are not under judgment, because that's what your word condemnation means if you're in Christ Jesus. Now, they went and, and somebody was like, oh, no, no, we, we can't do that. We couldn't possibly have no condemnation of Christ. It's got to have a condition to it. So they added a condition in. Now, like I said, there is plenty of evidence to show that this doesn't actually belong in Scripture. It's down a little bit farther in the passage where it's talking about how we actually live out uh, the law of the spirit of life. And that does relate to how we actually walk. We walk by the spirit, but not here. We are ones who are righteous before God. First Corinthians chapter one and verse 30. And this righteousness, by the way, is in Christ Jesus. He freed us from the sin nature, from the rule of the sin nature. That part of us that always wants to do those things that we know are wrong, and sometimes, oftentimes, we, it, it, it just takes control and we do those things and afterwards we feel really bad. That, we, well, prior to salvation, we didn't really have a whole lot of control over it. But now that we are actually saved, when you understand how to have control over it, oh boy, the thankfulness is just incredible because you actually overcome that desire that's continually, continually a thorn in your flesh. And you apply scripture correctly. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, 11, and uh, 14 all give us a proper understanding of that. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might not be done away with. Boy, that would be nice, but not until our resurrection. This word done away with actually means rendered ineffective, which means our sin nature may try to present desires but they're not going to work out the way they want. Not if we're walking by the Spirit. They will never produce, never be produced. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So with that, you know, the whole point of that is the fact that, you know, Thanksgiving and having a proper appreciation for what we are receiving really does actually require that we understand things, that we take the time to understand things. So that when we're expressing our appreciation, when we have that attitude of gratitude, it's because we understand the benefits that we're actually receiving. And of course, if we're understanding those, what should we be doing? Using them, applying them to our lives. As a slight side note, because I'm gonna talk about Thanksgiving a little bit more here in the, in the next one too. Thanksgiving, by the way, is not something that's just specific to humans. Other beings, other created beings actually are thankful also. Uh, we see a couple of examples of this. The cherubim in uh, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6. This is where it says, whenever the living creatures in the context of the cherubim give glory and honor and thanks 
they're thankful also. They express appreciation for God. And we also have it here done in worship in Revelation chapter 7 and verse uh, 12. And this is talking about in the context all um, spirit beings in the context of what it's talking about here. So we're going to go ahead and take a break and then we'll come back and we'll look at really what is the importance of an attitude of gratitude.